one month later and see you again. So um, the very first question is um, that, or question topic. Um, so first, welcome back um, to AirHex, and this is going to be the last AirHex before Java 1. And what happens, we will get an, um, a special event at Java 1, so it's going to be above Birds of Feather. And um, usually the Birds of Feather, the first days, take part in um, the Moscone Center, where Java 1 was um, at Sundays, but uh, it is now in, um, in Cyril Magnil, I think. Yes, uh, in um, in a hotel, and it is going to be at seven p.m. So, um, and what we what we would like to cover is the Java One news. So, what happened so far, and twenty years of Java. So, if you have any other questions, uh, put them here. And otherwise, I will just cover the live questions. Um, there are already, f I think, forty registrations, which is a lot for uh, such a show. And um, the room is not very big, so if you would like to attend, hurry up and um, pre-enroll to the sessions. Okay, this is the first one. And um, the, uh, the next topic is practices for securing third-party API credentials. So I got the question already, and I answered the last time, but uh, basic, basically the question is, as I will just go to the, um, to the regular gist, is um, API IDs and secrets from cloud deployed applications. And the question is, um, what are the best practices? And um, I mean, best practice, there is no best practice if you don't know what the goal is, right? So how secure has um, that does it have to be? And uh, is it an enterprise application? Is it a private cloud? Is it a public cloud? So we did once in a private cloud. So we just generated a token in the backend and we just um, and, uh, passed back and forth the, um, the token and it was either a header, I think it was even a header, HTTP header, and it worked well. If you are going to uh, to implement a public service, you have to be a little bit cautious, and especially if someone modifies the data. So what you probably would like to do is like compute some hash on the client and 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 um, and uh, send the um, hash along with the message to the server. And uh, best practices, what I usually do, I look at the popular APIs like um, uh, YouTube, GitHub, um, uh, even Twitter or whatever. And uh, and try to uh, to review what they actually did, and some parts are good, and some are not so great. So just uh, take some inspiration from existing APIs, uh, and we covered also that the last time. Um, so, but the best and and of course best practice. So what you will probably have also to do is if you are securing the API you have to implement something like a throttling. So you have to decide, you know, someone with the ID 42 should be not able to access the service more than, I don't know, five times a day. So you will have to implement such things. And again, there are no best practices because I really don't know what the requirements are. And um, if you are just, you know, if your service is just, I know, public weather service, it could be perfectly enough, you know, to, to have just SSL and nothing else. But yeah, so it really depends on your building. So uh, a billing service is going to be, has to be more secure than a weather service. Okay, the so next one, and this is an interesting question actually, um, is it really needed for a professional Java developer to read a whole book on IDE? Or a beginner to spend so much time to understand an idea rather than focusing on the language? And this is interesting one. And I think I tweeted uh, a question about the book, um, a question, a statement about the beginning NetBeans IDE for Java developers. And I got a copy from Heltian Vilenka, Vilenka, which is um, who is uh, the uh, product manager at Oracle for NetBeans. And I took a look at the uh, at the book and I like uh, parts of the book, particularly the refactoring um, uh, section. So um, I just um, uh, I glanced briefly over over the section. So it, it, it interesting topics. And the question is, um, is it any added value of doing so or not? And what you have to know, I actually read a book about a whole book about an editor. I think it was BB Edit, and I learned a lot, and I don't regret this. So um, I would say, what happens? If you read, or is there any book out there? So if you read the book, it, it causes you a harm, you know? This is the question. So um, the, the question is, what you would do instead, right? Uh, so what is the alternative to reading the book? Uh, just spend more time on language? This could be a great idea, but, um, you know, reading a book about IDE instead of watching Netflix could be could be even better idea. So um, I read lots of books, 
and I never regretted to, to read a particular book and on, on various topics. So, um, so it should be not necessary to read a book um, about IDE, but I would actually read Dean Edwin's book. It has a lot of screenshots and it is really, 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 really fast read. And, um, and um, to answer now the, the question more clearly, I'm actually not interested in books who would, uh, which would uh, um, um, explain me, you know, particular menus or features. What I would more interested in particular ideas behind an IDE, like for instance, Eclipse is all about plugins, you know, that you, you can configure everything and 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 whatever. And uh, IntelliJ would be more about usability and out of the box experience as well as NetBeans. So knowing such ideas at the beginning can be really helpful. Knowing this. Um, uh, just give you an an an, uh, an an brief idea. Let's see whether it is still the case. So I'm um, uh, the beginners uh, ask me a lot about Eclipse. So if you go to download, my the most frequent <laughs> question is, if I'm starting with Java developers, you know, which IDE to download? So if someone, if there, there would be, a, if there is an Eclipse book, if you read the book, you you would know. I don't know. I need this one, but not this one, and not this one. You know. Um, so. Um, I would say, if you have time, read the book. If you don't have the time, read, uh, learn the language. So this would be my official, official answer. Okay, this was a funny one. And I have heard uh, and read, uh, read about uh, Pega 7 platform from Pega Systems. I, um, I never heard this before, and I got a tweet from Zike, and I tried to look it up, and it is really hard to find any technical materials from Pega Systems, you know, without giving them uh, uh, address or whatever. And uh, I say, okay, forgot about Pega System. So, um, and and I try to review my uh, past projects. And and the statement is, uh, so let's say that Siga asked me, um, is it possible to to build a web app six point four times faster than Java E? So, um, in uh, my current project, which I fully implemented, um, I think I have I had fifteen days. Yes, 15 days to implement the whole application with you no know, uh, with meetings, uh, reviews, and, and and I don't know installation or whatever. So it would mean uh, with the with whatever I would be able to do it in two days. So I would say impossible. So the question is, you know, how may how much time uh, are you wasting with Java E comparing it to any other technology? And I say I can really hard imagine whether. There is something out there which is seven times faster or six times faster than Java E. What it can be, for instance, Java E is not um, this is not a a um, domain specific framework. So uh, let's say I would compare Java E with a content management system, and I would have to build a, comp a content management system. Then naturally, a content management system has to be more productive than Java E because I will have in Java E implement everything from scratch. But even in in uh, in this particular case, you know, I, I wouldn't be, uh, build everything uh, from scratch. I would just download no slingshot or or jackrabbit or whatever. I try to 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 reuse something, but you know, seven times is a lot. So it means uh, instead of seven months, one month, or two weeks, two days, or um, you know, let's uh, let's uh, boil down it to one week. So instead, using one thing, one week to one day is really hard to believe. What? Could be that they comparing to the old, you know, I don't know, nine years old J2E. Then I could even believe, but even then we use you no know, ant with with predefined X uh, generators, so we didn't implement everything by hand. So it was almost as productive as Java E uh, is right now. So um, it is hard to believe in as a general purpose pr uh, platform. What can be that there are systems out there which are domain specific, and then they have to be. Uh, more productive than Java E. Uh, otherwise, what, what is the point, right? Okay. So, authentication seems to be an, an really um, hot topic. And uh, a next question, how to implement authentication in J2 application? I'm starting a new application with JSF, EGB, JPA, and so forth. And um, it's something similar to Spring Security. And... Um, what um, what what happens frequently in projects? I just show you know the out of the box security, and every se and everyone says, "Oh, I didn't knew this." So, is it possible to use annotations? Of course, this is a built-in J2E security called rows allowed. We also covered this in the in the last workshop, and I think 
I will even record, uh, record a, a, a online workshop about security because I get a question a lot. And before I'm ready with this, I, I guess spring next year, what you can do, you can search for a free article of mine. It's called, um, it was in Java Magazine, and this was uh, Magazine Authentication. So, and this article is free. Download this on what I did in this article. I implemented a small example using Glasswitch, which is reference implementation. I used um, JDBC security realm. So I stored the, use and, uh, the user and roles in JDBC realm. And then I exaggerated a little bit and implemented my own custom roles and, 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 and security um, um, actions or uh, entitlements. And, w and, and, th and this article comes also with a sample application. It is already, how old is it? Uh, two years. So check it out and, um, and look at this. So uh, most, of the un uh, most of the questions are already answered in this article. And I think I will record our, a workshop about uh, authentication and authorization. Security will be too broad, but just, you know, Java e authentication and authorization might be a good idea. Okay, I will just paste um, the article to the chat. So and there is... Um, Oh, again, um, Joseph Potting asked right now, interested in your, t on your, in your thoughts on Oracle getting rid of Java Evangelist? So we had the question, I think, the last time. And if not, um, I also uh, answered the question uh, during the uh, Payara, uh, Payara interview with the Payara guys. So a short answer would be, um, it's a really pity but no one knows what's going on inside Oracle. Uh, it's a huge company, and it could be just a decision from one particular manager who would like you know, to save some money and save some budget in order to look good on paper. So this could be uh, a reason you, you shouldn't you know, uh, interpret too much. So let's see what happens on Java 1. Uh, there are going to be keynotes, and, and people could ask you know, the, the Oracle uh, people directly what's going on. So I'm really curious about Java 1. So, um, so come to Java One, uh, the um, the the uh, the buff, and, and see what happens then. Okay. Uh, Tony Stees at Twitter asked me, "When is it a bad idea to use EJBs? Um, if this is not a server side application, <laughs> probably. So on the server, I always use EJBs because it's incredibly easy and there is no overhead. So the question is, why not? So with a single app annotation, you can achieve a lot. Without EGBs, you have to, to think more what we are doing. With EGBs, it's just easy going. So I'm always using EGB, even more trivial applications, because there is, there is uh, no, no downside on this. Um, on modern server, of course, if you're using you know, some ancient uh, 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 technology, JDK 1.0 uh, application server, it might look differently. So, um, very good. Hope so. So we have the, um, okay. And now the question, we can always uh, answer the question is, uh, in this way. Um, EGB, JPA, MetaLS, JSF is more interesting. So the question is, what is JSF? And JSF is a servlet. Um, and most of the applications, uh, server frameworks, web frameworks are servlets. Knowing that, uh, you only have to look at the servlet security, which is based on the, I would say, standard HTTP security, which is very similar to, for instance, Apache security. So what you always get in Java E is, um, is uh, basic authentication, um, certificate, form-based authentication, and uh, the last one, is, I think, is called digest. Yeah, digest uh, authentication. So it boils down to form-based authentication and uh, and basic, which usually is base64 encoded username, colon, password, which um, I would, uh, or, or which you have to encrypt with SSL. And this is what you get for free. And uh, you are sending a realm, which is like the, the database. And on the server, the username and password is taken, is, 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 um, is transformed to a role, and the role is used for a role-based access control, RBAC, which is very similar to Unix, uh, to Unix control, uh, 
authorization system. So this is what happens always. Hope, always, it, it was never different on the application servers. Is from day one, this was how it was. And if you access the EGB through servlets, the EGB inherit the um, the principle and the role. So what is the role? Is like a group of principles. Okay. The next one, TechBird. Um, and I think TechBird attended one of the um, uh, AHEX um, Munich, um, AHEX workshop at Munich Airport. So um, I think he should know um, the answer. But what would be the behavior for method overloading in JaxRS? So the question is, we have a JaxRS method overloading and what is uh, the default behavior? And he has two methods. Uh, one is async response and the other one is create new transaction. And uh, what I understood is he would like to pass a transaction and collection of something. So, um, and this, there is, I think, no right answer to his question. So what I would, um, what I would ask for this is, um, if, if there's, actually this is not a meta overloading, like, like because a collection is, a, is another object. So I think in Java would be also not possible, you know, to have the, like uh, overload methods, or it could be possible. It is actually possible with having a string and, and string array in Java. But uh, the question rather is, um, why then he need a type safe uh, parameters? So um, if knowing this, I would rather cho choose a JSON object. Uh, why this? Yeah, because with JSON, JSON object, I get I was method overloading for free. The method is just invoked. With the uh, with the payload, and I can decide within the method what to do by converting the parameters. So instead of doing tricks with this, I would rather use JSONP, which I actually do a lot in the projects, and then there will be no problem with this. Um, what you also can do is like the uh, method overloading in HTTP, and this is uh, the MIME type. So you can just define your own MIME type, even the version of a MIME type, and you get a natural dispatching. How it would work? You could say a post and consumes um, um, application slash XML colon version one, two, or whatever you like, and the JAXRS will try to match the, um, the consume types and invoke the particular method. So what you're asking for is probably the, uh, the MIME type, but I would rather question you know, your approach to using JAXP at all. I would rather like to use JSONP um, in your case. Okay, now let's see what there are any questions. Everyone is happy here? Oh, Joseph Pottinger, did 1.0 have any app servers? First server spec was with 1.1. He's absolutely right. And Joseph, you know which one? Java Web Server was the very, very first one. Uh, you're absolutely right. So, um, so. Next, next one is a uh, Payara specific. What is Payara? Is like um, uh, Glassfish on steroids or uh, glass uh, Glassfish with commercial support, optional commercial support, or patched Glassfish. I use actually Payara lots in in on, on in my projects. What I don't use a lot. This is the Payara micro edition uh, version. What I rather use is the um, is the uh, full supported uh, version, so the, the standalone version. And the question is, what are my options for adding JDBC drivers and configured resources in Payara Micro? So what is the problem? So what I what I downloaded here is the Payara. So I can say Java minus jar Payara Micro, and it will boot the server. So fine, and, and you ask me, okay, but you know, how to configure anything here? And um, because if I stop it, uh, everything will disappear. And um, if I say Java minus jar, so what I, the answer is what you could do, you can provide a domain XML and the domain XML could specify data sources and JDBC drivers. The problem with JDBC drivers is of course, if you go here with Java minus jar and invoke this this way, there is no way to add the class path or to influence the class path from the outside. So it is really hard to put uh, the GDBC drivers from outside here. Um, so what you can do, of course, instead is the following. So what you could do, you can um, you could um, open, I think it's called better zip. Yes, Pyara Micro. 
So I'm just opening the uh, Payara jar. So it takes with uh, with basically WinZip, and there is a meta inf. And within the meta inf, I'm searching for manifest mf. Let's say uh, there should be one. And within the manifest mf, there should be manifest. Okay. And you see the main class, and this is what is actually executed. So what it means is, if I just copy this and go here, I could invoke this with Java minus CP Payara with the main, main method. And as you can see, it starts. So, but having used the CP, sorry, now I can put my GDBC drivers here and they will end up being in the class path. So uh, this answers the question how to put, you know, the uh, the class pass or how to set a class for Payara. So the quick hack should work. So, but uh, the, uh, this is a direct direct answer for the question. But I would actually never do this. So um, what I use a lot is a Docker, for instance. And in Docker, there is no difference whether you are starting with Java min minus jar the Payara or the full-fledged uh, um, application server. So because the, uh, the Docker image is built once, and um, or once always if the uh, release of the application server changes so um therefore i always use in docker the full-fledged payara and never the micro edition so micro edition is more interesting if you're running something without docker and then this is the answer to your question and um, what you can also do you can run payara in embedded mode and in this particular case uh in this particular case let's switch the gears um, this is actually an example from microservices workshop in Munich Airport. So what uh, I just did, there should be a Payara micro. Yes, I will just open this the folder here and show you the app. So, what you see here, I, this is, uh, I just implement a wrapper for Payara. So, I'm starting Payara here on port 80, um, 8082, and um, I just use the uh, setup JDBC command, and now I can do whatever I like. So, I, I use asadmin to set up the data source. It um, happens in no time, so it's extremely quick, and um, what I will always have to do is, of course, to put the JDBC driver in the class path, which I can absolutely do because it's my app, and this is the the different answer or the the another answer to your question. You know how to set up um, Payara persistently, and and the last thing you can do, uh, I think there is um, there is a um, a um, a method called installation root or something installation uh, directory, and then you can point to existing Glassfish domain XML. And then uh, the uh, Payara Micro will just pick all the settings from the existing Glassfish configuration. So I hope now the question is clear. This is a little bit Payara specific, but um, also interesting because there are lots of buzz, you know, regarding um, regarding um, micro application servers. And um, the uh, Payara Micro is 60 megabyte download size. And if you download everything, it's about 200 megs. So I'm actually not very interested in the optimization. So this is why I always use the, the full distribution. Um, so questions here. Oh, uh, Joseph Potting uh, uh, was working on on uh, some professional services. Project Jigsaw, yes, from from Apache. I think it was one of the Apache servers. And if you, if you work for some professional services, you probably know the um, Java, the whole history with Java, Java. What is it called JW SDK, like the predecessor of uh, of actually Tomcat and everything else. So thank you, Joseph. Okay. Then go to the next question. He, uh, the Mr. Vamara, 
I think his na first name is Daniel. He also attended the uh, he attended for sure the um, the air hacks at Munich Airport. And his question, he, he actually has to know the answer. <laughs> so um, he asked for how to inject resource bundles in Java. So this is his basic question. And um, in Java, sometimes it is easier to just to just show you an implementation. And the workspace is, is junk resource bundle dependency injection. So and the answer is very simple. You would like to have something like uh, Uh, resource bundle producer or factory is actually a factory and instead of resource bundle I would just use properties is the wrong producers this one um, and this would be Properties, props, equals new properties. Then props read wasn't in the read from. There was a method like uh, a load, not read. Load from input stream. This would be um, RB factory class get resource a stream um, my properties I actually don't like the my Duke is far far better Duke return props and of course catch uh, some exceptions uh, props so this is how to load properties and you could load whatever you like here and now the properties are injectable so it means if I would like would like to have a class let's call it um, air hex service so then I can go here and say add inject properties props props yeah and um, you can um, this may break but because I think properties come with a default constructor so what you will have to do is to introduce a qualifier and um, I would just say uh, configuration and this is a qualifier which is going to have the retention runtime and uh, target Uh, method and field yes and field and of course this has to be a annotation so now we can say the air hack service at configuration and uh, RB factory at configuration and because they match it's unique and if NetBeans recognize this so if I click here I end up being here and this should work so I will skip the deployment but it should work of course what I also need um, Duke properties here and I will have to modify it, the uh, POM XML in order to pick you know the properties from the right folder I hope it is clear and resource bundle would work the same way so questions here uh, Nocturne uh, ask me is it necessary a special configuration for Payara to production so we are using Payara in production there is no specific configuration what we do we um, increase the um, the heap size a bit and we add the uh, drivers in uh, current projects it is Oracle and there is uh, nothing else to do so um, this is what happens um, in our current projects with uh, with Payara and um, of course what you will have to do is you have to uh, test the performance and, 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 and the robustness, but this is nothing special with Payara. So, another question? Okay. So, 
So this is uh, so Daniel. I hope your your question is answered. And this is a bunch of good questions. What are Java beans, enterprise Java beans, managed beans, and backing beans? Okay, what is a basic Java bean? Basically, something with a default constructor. I think it's sufficient just with default constructor. Usually, you would like to have property accessors. So what it means there was old conventions so that each field is exposed on a getter and setter. And if you don't like then uh, the getters and setters, you would have to, to implement, I think what's called property descriptor, which describes which method manipulates the internal state. So there has this, this you know, private um, string name and get name and set name is just a Java beans convention. If you don't like convention, you could even change it with Java beans. So this is Java beans. Enterprise Java beans, sadly, have nothing to do with Java beans. Um, okay, nothing to do. They, they ha they, usually, they, they require a default constructor. This is what they have in common. So what the deal with Java beans, uh, um, with enterprise, with EJBs, enterprise Java beans. So in my eyes, enterprise Java beans are POJOs with default aspects, period. So if you put at stateless on a POJO, you get the POJO will get transactions, monitoring, security, logging uh, and um, self-healing for free. And self-healing is actually also a nice feature. Um, and throttling for free. So um, for instance, what we have right now, the EJB accesses a leg legacy resource and the legacy resource is not very stable. So it could throw exceptions. So in the case of um, exception, we switch to another node. And this happens automatically in EJB because on each runtime exception, the EJB is going to be destroyed and if it's going to be recreated, it automatically points to the uh, healthy resource. So this is Enterprise Java Beans. Um, manage Beans are as a very, I think the simplest, is one of the simple specifications in Java E, even simpler than, uh, simpler than uh, servlets. So what Manage Beans are, uh, uh, are or, or backing beans is uh, almost the same. So manage beans is spec, and what it basically says is there is something which is managed by a container, and it has post construct and pre post construct and pre destroy lifecycle methods, and it can also have fields which can be data bound to JSF. But I'm actually not sure whether the data bounding is a part of managed beans or JSF. But managed beans are usually tightly coupled to JSF or struts or frameworks like this or UI frameworks because uh, managed beans are usually used as uh, view models. And what backing beans is, is actually a view model. Uh, backing beans is a managed beans which is used for user interface. So managed beans is like more generic ter term. Let's say managed bean would be a POJO. And backing beans would be, let's say, a factory, which is, of course, also a POJO with specific purpose. So ba all backing beans are managed beans. Yes, usually. If you, if you would rely on container services or backing beans are managed beans, if someone mentions backing beans, it becomes automatically clear. Someone thinks about having a POJO with uh, uh, property accessors or Java bean, and this POJOs, the POJO was created uh, just to uh, to expose some state to UI. So does inject work in here? If we want to inject something from jar to a war, it should work. I have to admit, I didn't use ears for years, so I always use war, but it also should work in ear. So I, I, I hear from time to time problems with... Um, with uh, with ears and injection, my answer is always, you know, drop the ears, so um, <laughs> extract everything and put everything on war and go with this. And the, the, the third um, question is, can we use Java 7 into our Java FX applications? And um, kind of. So what I implemented is the project Afterburner and, and what it supports is at inject dependency injection. But it has nothing to do with Java 7. I just, you know, used the same annotation for implementing the dependency injection. So it looks like weld dependency injection, but it is not. So um, Java 7 and Java X has nothing in common. Java X is more related to Swing to do as to Java 7. So and now uh, another um, afterburner specific question. Is someone asked me there is a JavaFX view with Afterburner FX in the um, and um, so how it usually works? It is like uh, the Afterburner. There is a pair, uh, pair. Um, it is um, a view written in Java, 
and the layout is done in FXML. So usually the view is empty. And um, uh, he asked um, how to extend the uh, or how to extend the view with Java code and not with FXML. And the answer is very simple: just override some methods. And I think the one method is like uh, get view. And if you if you invoke this method, you get the uh, the the view, and you can do whatever you like. You can add you know components. You you, you have basically the um, the node. And you can add to the node whatever you like. It is similar like the J panel in Swing. So you could, you know, add text areas, text boxes, whatever you like. So um, and the example it would be trivial. So the example is trivial. So um, you will have to override methods. This is the the answer. So it is um, there is nothing else to do um, uh, in the framework. Um, and I thought about an example, but it's really hard to find an example uh, where it. This is needed. So actually, from day one, I thought uh, it, it would be necessary to implement something in Java, and I don't know a single project who uses actually this. So everyone relies on FXML. And by the way, the Afterburn FX is far more popular than I ever expected. So it is like it took off, and and it's really interesting because people say, okay, Java VIX is dead. No one uses Java VIX, and I got lots of questions regarding Java VIX. So let's see. Um, Probably I could even, let's see whether I can quickly swap the workspaces here. So Afterburner, and this should be an example. The Follow Me, and the Follow Me has to have some dashboard and view. And this is how it looks like. This is the view, it is backed by FXML. And I can say override methods and there is a method get view and there is a get view without root container and you get the node just the the base node so if you override this this is actually wrong and you have the node here you get the node here so this was created by fxml and now you can add whatever you like here get Just get uh, nodes or get a children or something, and then you can add the other nodes to this and extend the node with whatever uh, you like, and um, you can hook into this method. Okay, or even get view. This is what um, um, what is what is called out of the box. By the way, um, Afterburner, what I implemented because lots of requests, but I cannot test this. You will find a new snapshot of Afterburner in the Sonar type. It should be you know one week old. And what, what is implemented, um, it is no more case sensitive. So you can name, you know, this FXML, however, however you like, like lowercase or camel case, everything has to be loaded. So in my case, on a Mac, it always works, but I get some complaints that like someone um, uh, named the FXML file in camel case and after when I couldn't find it. So at first I tried to improve the error uh, messages and um, attempted to make it case insensitive. So if you can, please, Test it and give me a feedback. Okay, let's see what happens here in chat. Everyone is quiet, which is a good sign or a bad sign. So the next question, what are good ways to inject the configuration into Docker image? So you can use the same word Docker image in different steps of staging or with different configurations for different customers. Um, so we're using Docker right now, and we have three, three stages, and uh, there is no injection in the in the Docker image. So what it actually means is we have one base image with the application server, and from this image our application image inherits. So there is a, something like a, a layer inheritance in in Docker, and the application server is configured um, in that way that it always that the uh, name of the application is exposed. To the application the same way so you don't have to change anything in the war um, what you sometimes have to have you have to uh, change the application server configuration so it points to different to different uh, to different data sources and what you can do uh, what what uh, where to do this usually in um, within at, at, at the build time of the image 
So you can add additional statements. Usually, usually there are no one to three statements like, you know, a data source, a GMS, or, or change the data source and increase the heap size. If you, you need in production more heap size than in, than in um, integration. If you if you're thinking in lar larger scale, it might be a good idea to provide a configuration service, which pulls the configuration from a central uh, area, and there are already ready-to-use solutions for this. But um, it will, I would immediately think on a RESTful web service, which uh, goes to a database and 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 gives back properties, which you can easily inject, for instance, um, and um, or usually what you will do uh, a small a small, not DSL, but yeah, a script, NAS1 script, for instance, which uh, changes the application server configuration. But if my, my very first attempt would be, you know, don't change anything, configure the application server and don't change the war at all. So the war has to, to remain the same. So there is no discussion, discussion about this. Also the data source names, all the resources, the naming has to be the same. What only changes is the administration of the application server. So um, what it means is the, um, the configuration where the data source or the queue points to. So what can change IP address or, or port number, but um, nothing else. One of the last official questions, I have some more questions on my on my blog. How would you annotate a JPA one to many relationship with lazy loading for JAXP? And this is a little bit contradicting because JAXP requires eager loading and one to many per default is lazy loading. So if you are using one to many without anything in JAXP, you get uh, like lazy loading from JPA, which is immediately loaded by JAXP. In this particular case, I would got eager loading. I would rather go the eager um, loading uh, route because then all the depending entities would be loaded um, once and then exposed via JAXP. So um, I think that it does not make any sense to, 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 to load something uh, lazily first and a millisecond later eagerly load it with uh, JAXP and expose it to clients. Having said this, in more sophisticated projects, I, I always tend to use JSONP and this is my ultimate layer for uh, uh, or my DTO layer. And this is the last official question, but what I uh, gathered some questions from uh, from my blog, uh, blog comments and this is one uh, I mentioned in earlier shows um, that uh, you don't need um, clustering with EJBs and Samdani uh, asked me in the in the blog comments, there is an older comment, uh, why no need clustering? So this is actually the the uh, the questions, the question about this. Where is actually my... Here. Yeah. And um, so um, it is hard to explain, but very easy to draw. And I will try to, to, to draw the solution here. So the EJB clustering, how it works. Back then it worked that way. So we had a class and this is, and we had a remote interface. And the remote interface was implemented by so-called smart stops. And the smart stops were smart because they pulled the IP definition from application servers on JBoss. The name was cluster view back then. There were different application servers. So one application server, another application server. So beautiful servers here. And this is the implementation. So, and the smart stops knew where the implementation are living. So we have one EGP here and one EGP here. So um, they, you could implement here, you could, you could specify an algorithm, usually in proprietary deployment descriptor and say, you know, take this one round robin and this one, or the best one was random. And usually such EJBs will directly access by swing or some crazy applications uh, decided to put everything from here to a UI layer, which run on different application server. And the hope was to increase um, scalability, which usually never happened, but um, this was actually the idea back then. So why it doesn't matter anymore? Because um, I would say 
uh, using uh, using EJBs is an anti-pattern. So what you um, what you sh should use instead is uh, local interfaces. So what it actually means, you have one EJB which is local, and one um, and this is directly injected to let's say uh, we have it already to a backing bean, right? Or a JAXORES resource which is exposed via HTTP but because this is a local communication in process there are no more smart stops involved and no more clustering so the EJB clustering is pointless if the whole transaction is executed within the same process within the same JVM so this EJB clustering makes only sense if you would distribute one call among JVMs and processes which is a really bad idea actually doing this so um this is the, um, the 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 reason why I mentioned uh, several times. You know, uh, uh, don't use clustering and EJBs. It doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, yeah. Hope it's clear. So. Question is: There is a good alternative to GSF session scope. Actually, session scope in GSF is deprecated. Uh, the only way is to CDI session scoped. Or uh, I don't know how to interpret the question. You could use uh, view scoped, for instance, as well. Okay. And also interesting. Uh, why did you stop using Apache James on the server? So what James is is a um, Java Apache Mail Enterprise server. I use it um, for all my mailing system even five years ago, I think. What I also had, I had a um, my own DNS service. And um, I extended the James a lot with so-called mailets. It was like an applet. And what a mailet was is, uh, yeah, you could, it's like a James plugin. And what I implemented um, in the different uh, spam prevention systems, whatever. And it was a fun. But um, and in one point of time, I didn't learn anything new. So I decided to, to go uh, to just to drop James and use an external provider. And um, yeah, this is why I did. And also the, the, the bandwidth was the problem because of bouncing mails. In one point, it was really heavy. So um, yeah, bandwidth, maintenance, and uh, reliability, I would say, because everything ran on one machine. And if the machine went down, you know, everything was down. Um, yeah, this is the main reason. But I used James, I think, 10 years or something. So um, I, had, I had really fun with James. So and um, I still use James. Oh, this is um, um, actually... If you have, you know, to test, uh, for instance, a, uh, a mailing service. So what you can perfectly do, you can install James as your, as your mail service, set up James, and send emails to James, and then you can pull your mails from James and, and, and test the whole application, which is uh, really hard without James. So uh, back then, we also evaluated there were uh, the, uh, the, the typical Linux, Linux uh, mail servers, but they were really hard to, to set up, and James was really easy. Um, so, um, what uh, Tony Weston says, so I would just have to look at the, um, at, the, and the uh, at the comment. And he says, I don't like exposing my domain via REST. And, uh, and the reason is because the domain contains uh, um, the layout of the data. And if you, if you expose this, it violates the encapsulation. And if you have more than a couple of clients, you will be uh, you will never able to change your domain again. Yes. So now, my answer to this sentence is the following: violating encapsul encapsulation. So I would say I don't care about this. But the consequence, he is absolute right. So what what he says is, if you have more than a couple of clients, which is absolutely right. So I would say, if you cannot control or if you don't know who uses your API, you, you not only cannot expose the domain object, objects, what usually means it is a bad idea to go type safe route because if you even introduce DTOs, you cannot change the DTOs for one client because it will break all other clients. And instead, always put a DTO layer. So I'm 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 not I'm not agreeing with the always because always is a little, always problematic. Um, a DTO layer in front of the domain, I would say 
if you have multiple clients, it might be a good idea. And I wouldn't suggest to use DTO for the purpose. What I, for instance, use, I use JSONP. Um, so the JSON, JSON objects and JSON arrays. And this is a built-in DTO without implementing a dedicated layer. And always put a DTO layer in front of the domain is a really very bad idea. So I performed several code reviews th this year. And uh, what I have to say, in 80% of all projects, DTOOs were, were, were nearly identical to entities and they caused lots of code duplication without any additional benefit. Um, and the DTO should be modeled on exactly what the client wants. And the question is, you know, why the client needs something different than the database? And the answer is, again, if you have a couple of clients. So I would say, if you are building an internet scale service and you're exposing to multiple different applications, first, it, you, you have to invest a lot in, in, uh, in, in backward compatibility. And this is really hard to achieve with type safe objects. So it might be a good idea not only to introduce an anti-corruption layer, it could be even better idea to use something like JSON, which is not type safe and so more flexible, but requires more testing. I hope now it's crystal clear and everyone agreed, hopefully. So, and the very last one. Um, he asked me, what are your thoughts on TDD? I have never seen your comments about this topic. And the green book is this one. He likes the green book. So, um, um, test-driven development. So, if let's assume we we take it seriously, TDD. Um, let's yeah, let's assume we take uh, TDD. So we have test-driven development. We had uh, contract-first development. We have uh, multiple driven developments. My point being is, you know, how much developments would you like to have, right? You cannot be test-driven, contract-first, and whatever. You could be, but I would say, um, so I, I um, delivered a talk. It was like, I think it was um, it was like, just do it, or I just forgot the name. I just I just made up a, a name. It was something like driven development, and um, I would just say, okay, if you just you know test, if something is complex, then test it, but don't test getters and setters. You know, and be very dogmatic. It's like always write the test first. It 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 works rarely in the in practice. So I would say test driven development for specific specific parts of the application, like the REST service, is a very good thing because you are forced to look at the, on the specification from the outside, on the API from the outside. You know, using test-driven development and pair programming and contract first for everything, I would say is a huge waste of time. But I never saw this in reality. So um, in if I perform a code review for a project or work on a project, you know, uh, uh, the developers suspect me to be, you know, the TDD uh, uh, protagonist, which I'm really not. Because um, I say, okay, um, here you should write here a test, here a test, and here a test. Because I'm believing that if you write a proper test, you really will save time. But if you write test first for everything in very dogmatic way, you won't save the time, and you will probably spend a lots of lots of time on testing uh, things which are not not relevant. So I don't like any dogmatic processes, and whatever driven is always suspicious to me. Okay. I think we we were actually incredibly fast. I would just take a look on uh, on the uh, chat and take a look on Twitter. And there is uh, um, no questions. Oh, the last thing, someone asked me about the, um, the Vimeo course here. So the effective Java E, um, it works well. I got lots of comments here, actually, uh, lots of interactions. So it is uh, um, really interesting feedback from, from the users. And uh, it was bought from 36 countries, which is amazing. I never thought about this. Lots of um, people from Africa, which, which is crazy, so that uh, Java is so popular, so which I really like. 
And um, I'm in right now already um, recording some another course, uh, which is loosely related to the first one. So um, thank you for buying this, and um, and thank you especially for the for the comments. And uh, if you don't like online courses, come to Munich. Otherwise, see you at Java One. And probably we can, uh, uh, after the Birds of Feather session, just come to me and ask questions, whatever. Say hello. I would really appreciate this. As we spend the whole week at Java One, we'll attend as many sessions as only possible. And um, yeah, uh, and we'll record a show, a show and try to publish the show, the uh, Java One session after Java One. Um, so it will be almost a part of the regular AirHex workshops. So uh, thank you for watching and see you uh, at Java One and then. As always, next month, first Monday of the month. Um, thank you for watching and bye.